I'm, I'm Peter from Big Society Capital. I'm really delighted to, that we were able to put this event on today with Trustees Unlimited and to see so many of you so early in the morning. Um, our role today is really to set the scene in terms of social investment and whilst we're both, um, our jobs now are very much involved in the social investment space, um, both of us have been involved in the sector um, prior to this in terms of uh, as, a st as staff, as trustees and as volunteers. Um, before I joined Big Society Capital I was lucky enough to be Finance Director of the Disability Charity Scope, um, so I'm really pleased that one of my former trustees is here in the room as well. Um, just to explain a little bit about Big Society Capital, so we were set up um, a few years ago now, we're an independent organisation set up to grow the social investment market in the UK. Um, so we, um, we believe that um, we want to see more charities and social enterprises being able to use investment to scale up their impact. And we do that through two routes. Um, one is as an investor, so we're fortunate enough we will have £600 million over our lifetime and we invest that through funds and into other organisations and social finance providers who then go on to support the charity sector. And some of the organisations you're going to hear from later on have indirectly benefited from our investment. Um, I guess more importantly for us, we have a market championing role, so we want to see this, this market grow and develop. Um, we work with the financial sector to encourage them to think about putting investment and some of the money that they have towards um, generating social good. Um, and in my role, we work in partnership with the charity sector to increase awareness of social investment amongst the leaders and decision makers in charities. So we um, absolutely recognise that social investment is not the right thing for every charity but we want to see more boards, chief execs and senior managers being aware of social investment as one of the options that is available to them. I'll let Jim say Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, Helen's introduction about Stephen Lloyd, our dear Stephen Lloyd, and um, then Geeta's introduction really leads in very well to why I'm here and why I do what I do. I'm a partner at Bates Wells Braithwaite. I'm the only non-law partner, which meant that the firm had to change its constitution to let me in, which I'm grateful they did. Um, Stephen and I have worked together for many, many years um, supporting the charity sector and social enterprise in developing, in meeting the challenges that are facing it um, today and over decades in fact. Um, two areas that we felt that the sector was having more difficulty grasping and using to its own ends, which we wanted to do, um, are mergers and acquisitions and fundraising and then um, impact measurement and developing um, social impact delivering projects. So we set up two extra divisions within Bates Wells Braithwaite, which I direct, to support the sector in accessing that. So from today's point of view, um, I'm an advisor, I'm a programme developer working with charities and social enterprises, and I develop social investment strategy and support charities in accessing that capital and talking to Peter, her organisation and others. So what we're going to do today um, is give you this overview which I think will then lead very well into the discussions from various people from the charity sector about what social investment has meant to them and various different aspects of it. So it's very live, real and case study based. So without any more ado, right, Geeta's doing the clicker, that's great. <coughs> Go for it. why we're here and why you, you all do the, the roles that you do as, as trustees or as staff. Um, so we know that charities and social enterprises are tackling some of the most difficult <coughs> issues um, today and demand for those services is only increasing, whether that's because of public sector funding pressures or because of demographics. And I guess against that background, we're increasingly seeing charities looking to both diversify their income, look at social enterprise models, and now increasingly look at, look at social investment and repayable finance as one of a number of different options to help them deliver their strategies. Okay. Um, the charity sector is not the only part of the world that is tackling social investment and is benefiting from it. Um, this was from an article in um, Charity Finance 
the back end of last year. Um, what, what you'll see there in the middle, the investees, um, can you see social action charities and profit with purpose organisations, which are essentially, or sorry, purpose with profit, which are essentially social enterprise. This is where we're all sitting, but we're part of a continuum of delivering social change within our sector, which includes the private sector and various other organisations besides. Now we deliver social change, social benefit, but we also influence others in the private sector and beyond to do the same. Um, the form of value that we deliver comes in two areas. The blue at the top, we try to avoid creating social damage. We try to influence the private sector to avoid creating social damage as they do what they do. And we also actively, in the black, we deliver value through philanthropy, giving for good work, through blending value where we can generate money alongside the delivery of social interventions and share value by influencing the way in which trading operations trade so that they drive social value as they trade profitably. Okay. So uh, just taking it back to the basics, really, what is social investment? Well, for us at Big Society Capital, social investment is essentially finance that's provided to charities and social enterprises where the investor expects their money back. So this isn't a grant, we're talking about repayable finance. Normally they want their money back with some form of return on top, and the amount of return might depend on who that investor is, um, whether they're a pension fund or whether they're a foundation or just an individual who's interested in a, uh, a project that's perhaps close to their heart. Um, but the investor, whoever they are, is, is motivated by and values the impact that's been generated from that investment. Um, so social investment can look very different, so this is, um, you're going to hear later on from Alistair Graham from Golden Lanes Housing, um, they basically issued um, a, a £11 million charity bond a year or so ago, so in that, in that case this was a form of investment that look, was very much akin to mainstream investment, so issued by a large organisation that institutions and sort of retail ordinary investors could have invested in, that so looked like a sort of a, a, a standard financial product that you might see in the corporate world, and at the other end you've got, um, this is a very small organisation called um, Bramley Baths, based, based up in quite a deprived part of Leeds, um, um, who basically came together to take over a local community facility, so a grade two listed building that was due to be closed down by Leeds Council. Um, the local community decided that they wanted to keep the facility running, they set up their own not-profit, a uh, not-for-profit organisation and went to a range of funders with a, a funding package which included grants and a, and a very small loan in this case, a £50,000 loan from um, a social finance provider there called Key Fund. So I think into thinking about relevance, there's a sense sometimes that social investment is only relevant to very large organisations and I guess I just want to say that's not always the case. Okay. We've been wildly and wantonly using that word social as if we all know what it means. Um, let's just recap on that. It, it is now defined, which is quite helpful, um, in uh, a paper by the European Commission. Um, social. When we talk about social, we're talking about the relationships between people, how an individual relates to their family, how they live within their community, how they relate to the state, but also the individual's relationship with themselves, their well-being. How do I feel about myself? Am I confident? Am I sad? Am I comfortable? Am I positive? Um, this all comes within that range of social. So when we're talking about social, it's about relationships and communities and how people live with each other and themselves. An outcome, another sort of buzz phrase, isn't it? We talk in our sector about changing lives, don't we? I've heard it so many times, delightful actually. Um, that change would be termed an outcome. So for outcome, read change. And then impact, impact is the extent to which you your wonderful organisations contributed to the change that was made. So social between people, outcome is change, impact 
is the extent to which you contributed to make it happen. Thank you. Um, well, I guess most everyone here is, is committed to delivering that kind of impact and change for their organisations and the people they need to support. But really, why would you think, as a charity, why would you even have countenance taking on repayable finance? And I guess just wanted to talk uh, through a few reasons that um, charities such as Scope and others have, have gone down this route. So I guess one is around potentially it's being more flexible than grants. So grant funding is often seen to be quite prescriptive in terms of how you spend the money. Social investors are generally only interested in the outcomes that you're generating from that money. Um, there's often a point about sort of business discipline and effectiveness that can come through taking on investment and I've talked to charities who do say actually the, the process that you have to go through in terms of thinking about can you repay the investment, is the um, activity that you're planning to do um, likely to be sustainable, all of that thinking can really um, help them bring more rigour to some of, some of their work. Um, depending on who you're accessing as investors, there's often softer benefits to be gained from social investment. So, um, again, for, in, in Scope's case, we went out to a number of different individuals to be able to ask for um, relatively soft loans in, in some cases. And we basically tapped into a network of more influential people, high net worth individuals who maybe wouldn't have been interested in our organisation otherwise. And we see that also happening at, at community level with, with crowdfunding and other sources of investment. Um, some people very much value the, um, imp the expertise and input and, and um, that, that, that investors can bring. Um, and again, depending on the form of investment that you take on, um, you can actually have people being as directly involved as taking a seat on your board. Um, and then fun fundamentally, this is all about increasing your impact. So uh, no charity should be going down this route unless they thought they were going to be able to scale up what they do. Um, well, th some of the things that I get asked first uh, when I meet charities in this space is just really thinking through um, what, how can I access investment, what, how, what, how do I get into this space? And there's three basic questions I guess I always start off with. So the first is really about what do you need investment for? So if you had that upfront money today, what would you use it for? Would you use it to buy a building? Um, to, um, would you use it for working capital to perhaps um, help fund the payments by results contract? Would you use it into scaling up and developing your services elsewhere? Um, the second thing is really, it really sounds really obvious, how are you going to repay the money? So is there an income stream attached to the activity that you're planning on doing? Um, one of the things we did at Scope was to invest into fundraising, so into donor recruitment and to expanding our retail charity shop. So both activities where we um, had a track record, we knew what the income streams would be from um, an upfront investment now. And the advantage to us was about increasing that unrestricted income much quicker on, on, on a longer term basis. And then again, the, 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 the most important point really um, for, for boards thinking about this is how is this going to increase your impact overall as an organisation? Raising capital. An almost bewildering array of capital is out there. So let's try and get a bit of structure around it and see that it does fall into certain groupings. Um, let's split it by types and sources of capital and then how do we get there? How do we start the debate with them? Um, types and sources. Um, conventional institutional sources, banks. Many of our capital projects, our capital builds in the sector have been funded by banks in the past. And that still remains a major funding source um, for this whole sector. So I would treat them as conventional institutions. They tend, we talk about senior debt, secured debt, the sort of thing that you would raise from one of the banks for funding a building. Um, we also have junior debt, which is the term generally for unsecured debt, um, maybe top-up finance on the building, um, or maybe cash flow finance for developing a project. Um, and then quasi-equity, oh, the terminology. Um, that means works a little bit like shares in a company. So we understand how shares work. You put your money in, you hope to get a yield, and you're the last, last line of um, defence. Uh, the last one, the first one to lose their money if it starts to go a bit pear shaped. So that's quasi equity. Um, social investment sources, which Gita was mentioning, um, Big Society Capital, Bridges Ventures, um, Triodos Bank, there's a number of them around who will deliver senior, junior and quasi-equity, but also we're seeing the emergence of underwriting and guarantees coming from them. Um, some of the 
organisations spinning out from the public sector to become charities um, need guarantees to help them lease vehicles for hospital transport and things like that. Um, and we're seeing the emergence of various specialist investors, some of the charitable foundations are getting into this field, and there are specialist funds developing deliberately to invest in this arena. Private individuals, this one's existed for yachts, actually. Um, private individuals giving loans to their favourite local charity to help them get a project off the ground. That's where this has developed further. But we've now got social investment tax relief, which is that um, acronym there, which helps those individuals get a bit more tax relief on putting those investments in. And we see the emergence of crowdfunding, which is lots of people doing very small amounts of money for broadly the same sort of projects. Okay, how do we get to the markets, get to these funding? There are three broad ways of doing it. You go directly and ask, you go to a club or group who are already in the room who are up for it, or you go to the listed markets. And that again is an access point. So those are the three headings. Um, institutional fundraising is going and talking to Big Society Capital, to Triodos, to Bank Scotland, whoever it might be, um, about a proposal and negotiating the money in from them. Um, the private placement, there are angel clubs in this sector, just as there are in the private sector, but we can also access the market through the social stock exchange, which now has a trading facility and is worth, worth an interesting look for larger fundraisings, and um, special access points like Alia's retail charity bond um, platform, which enables larger fundraisings to access the listed markets directly. And then of course we can do as Scope did, and access directly on the Luxembourg Exchange. Did. Okay. Uh, okay, this is, uh, I guess, uh, related to um, the different sources that um, Jim's put together, but hopefully a, a simpler way to try and classify those sources of finance. So, um, we, if we, when we look at now the array of different social investment tools and products that are out there, um, we tend to sort of classify them in these ways. So, most of what um, charities will look to do is just around straightforward borrowing, so straightforward secured loans, which may be from a mainstream bank or from um, a social lender such as a Triodos or a charity bank. So, if you were a charity who was wanting capital for investment to help finance a property, um, or building space project, um, you could look at traditional secured loans, as I said, you could look at issuing a charity bond, and Alistair Graham again can, will talk, talk through, I think, a great example of how that's been done in practice. Um, you can also look at vehicles which are sort of off the balance sheet, so um, most forms of investment will be um, forms of borrowing or finance that will sit on your balance sheet, but there are now some tools that sit off your balance sheet. So in the last few years we have put money into um, it's social investment property funds, so what the, where, where these play a role is where a charity feels that in this one, one of these instances is among us Broadway a homelessness charity who wanted to scale up its work in London providing room on accommodation for homeless people. They didn't want to go and borrow the, the many millions of pounds that they would have to in order to be able to access those properties in London. So they worked with a social finance specialist to develop a social property fund. Lots of investors, including ourselves, foundations and local authorities have invested money into that fund, which then goes out and buys properties in London. And the charity then leases the properties from the fund. So that's 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 what the, the, the sort of the debt and the investment doesn't sit on the balance sheet, but that it enables them to access the properties that they need to. Um, if you look sort of at the bottom half, I guess, of this grid, um, you're then looking at um, unsecured funding. So again, we know many charities in the sector don't have any assets to, to, to borrow against or they want capital for other reasons, so it's not to purchase property, but it's to um, give them working capital to um, set up a new enterprise or to expand the enterprise activity that they're doing. And there, the most um, obvious form of, a common form of finance is unsecured loans, and there's now different sources of, uh, to, to be able to access those, as Jim outlined. Um, we're also aware that um, many organisations want quite small forms of finance, so not you know, the hundreds of thousands of pounds, maybe tens of thousands of pounds, and there needs to be um, more availability of that form of finance, and we're working with others to make that available through um, either a combination of grant or, uh, or loan to help make that more economic. 
Um, Jim has talked about crowdfunding, another way about being able to access unsecured lending. Um, on the other side, in terms of, sort of off-balance sheet options, um, there's, there's sort of specialist vehicles, really, and I won't talk about this in a huge amount of detail, although I think it's going to be the case study that um, will be spoken about later, is um, a, a social impact bond. So social impact bonds are a very specific form of social investment that link together, provide upfront finance to finance payments by results contracts um, that deliver savings for the state. But um, the thing there to note there is that the charity is not taking on the risk of, of it, the financial risk of investment. So the charity is not borrowing the money, but um, investment is provided into an independent vehicle and then um, passed down to a charity to enable them to deliver services. Um, I, we can pick up more about that in the Q and A. I think later, if, if that's of interest. Thank you. Okay. So, how do you tackle this area if you want to look at it? A um, few thoughts here. Um, <coughs> First of all, work out what funds you need and then revisit that because I certainly find that um, most organisations, their first pass at it, either overcast the amount they need or underscore it significantly. So think what you need, then go back and have another look at it and think if you could reduce the amount or if you're really allowing enough for the leeway that you'll need. Um, understand the purpose. What's the fund going to fund? Because that will affect who you go to to get it funded and the structure that you use and the time period over which you need it. Do you actually need the money over 18 months to get over a hunt? Or is this a 3 year, 10 year, 20 year period? Understand that and what drives it and changes it. Um, the risk profile of it. What is the risk of it going pear-shaped, what is the risk of you not being able to meet the interest in a particular year, the return in a particular year, and how could we then share it? Risk arbitrage is a term for understanding the risk, dividing it up into small parcels, and enabling the different parties to take the parcel they're most able to cope with. They're sharing. Um, what yield can you afford? What interest rate can you afford? What repayment can you afford? And over what period? Because pitching into a contract you can't afford sounds pretty unhelpful. Um, funder type, I listed out the different types of funders on the previous page, but they have different styles and approaches and different interest in supporting the project. And they will, for perfectly good reasons, behave differently when they're actually invested in you. So get one that you can work with that really aligns with what you're trying to achieve. Simplicity, please, please, keep it simple, keep the pitch to the funder simple, the project as simple as you can, and then everyone will understand and go along with it. Um, liquidity and um, redemption and structure. Liquidity is about how you're going to generate the cash to repay it. Um, what happens if the funder changes their mind? or they need to withdraw partway into the arrangement. Okay, Geeta, that okay. point? Um, well, I guess just to put some of that theory into practice and in an example, um, this is Fair Share Southwest, um, a charity based down in Bristol dealing with um, dealing with people who are well, people locally who are unable to um, unable to afford um, to access food to get for a healthy diet. Um, but what they do is they work both with the food industry to help um, take away and use surplus food that would otherwise go to waste and to provide those to local organisations who are working with vulnerable people or people, people in poverty. Um, what they also have on the sideline is a social enterprise, a catering club that uses some of that surplus food and employs people who are furthest away from work. Um, and they wanted to scale up that enterprise activity. And the way they did that was by accessing a £70,000 loan to help them do more, do more of that work and to generate more income for the charity. Um, the three things really I wanted to draw out about that particular investment. So one is that it's a, it's a relatively small amount of money and it's a relatively small charity actually. So the income there was about, I think they were, had around £400,000 before they started off. Um, the second is that they raised that investment from individuals, so again, people aren't always sure about that, but um, down in Bristol they've set up a pilot fund um, by an organisation called Resonance looking at how they can engage local individuals investing into the local area. 
And the third is that, excitingly, for, for sort of social investment geeks, this was the first deal that dealt with that, that used the social investment tax relief. So this is a tax relief for individuals um, who basically get an upfront 30% relief on, on amounts that they lend or invest at risk into charities or social enterprises. Um, and what that uh, what that relief enabled um, to happen is that one, it enabled the the um, investors to uh, their their required rate of return or their financial return expectations from the investment were lower than they would have had had the relief not been in place, and therefore that made the investment affordable for the charity. So had they not had the relief in place, the charity may have had to offer a much higher level of interest, which in this case wouldn't have been affordable for them. Um, and so. The, that's what I wanted to close with on that, on that, on that example. Thank you. Before we move on um, to June, I just wanted to, guess, I guess, bring it back to the trustee perspective and why we, why we're here. So um, we, uh, we've been talking to uh, the trustees who are thinking about this space, and often in the in the management teams that I speak to, they're they're not sure how to engage the trustees around this area. It feels new, and as you've seen, can feel very, uh, very complicated. But I think it's just important to recognise that. All of the norms, the principles around decision making and risk management that the Charity Commission have laid out, they all apply to social investment in exactly the same way. So, are you acting in the best interests of your trustees, um, how, uh, of your of your beneficiaries? Um, are you ensuring that you're sufficiently well informed? So, whether that's getting advice from your management team or independent advice if you need to, and are you sufficiently aware of the risks that are involved? Um, we've spent the last few months talking to a number of different charities, both at trustee level and chief exec level, to get who've taken on investment to get a sense of, 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 of um, the common sort of issues and challenges. And I guess there was, there was three things I draw out of that that feel common across the piece and are just probably aspects of good governance. So. One is um, the need to really have a balanced board in this in this process. So um, the, there is for the, the organisations that have used investment. There's definitely a sense where there are some people on the board that have either fin financial skills, commercial skills, and a kind of knowledge and understanding of how investment might work, perhaps in a different context. Um, but that does have to be balanced with with other perspectives. Um, second, I think, is really around um, the relationship between the exec and the trustee board. So, is that that sense of sort of openness to looking at new things, um, giving the management team perhaps but, um, a, the freedom to go off and have a look at social investment and explore whether it's right for their organisation, but also the, the role of challenge in terms of asking the right questions and really um, reviewing the, 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 the um, projects that come forward. And then I think the last thing that, that really has been striking for me is that irrespective of the organisation, some of them are small, some of them are large, um, that all of them seem to have a sort of shared sense of vision and conviction between the trustees and the management team that, um, that absolutely their ambition is to reach as many people as they can do and that this was the potential reward in terms of that increased impact is very much worth the additional financial risk that's been taken. And I think it's that balance that's, that, that has to be struck all the way through the conversation. So... Um some thoughts to leave you with before you start hearing the case studies and this comes very close to personal experience of um, charity of which I'm a trustee is looking currently at do we raise quarter of a million pounds to step us forward in something that we're trying to do at a time of great need, great social need in our constituency. So question, opportunity, if you had more capital, a bit more, within a sensible range, what could you do? Could you do something extra? Could you invent or improve something? Could you reach more people? Fine to move forward. It certainly needs care in stepping forward with thought, but not timidity. Um, there are too many organisations where um, the trustees bring immense business, social delivery, all sorts of experience and then leave all of that chained to the railings with their bike outside the room. Um, so bring that in and think as you would in a, in a non-charity business about how you could do it. Um, this is an area of opportunity, make it work for you and your beneficiaries, make it work to your purpose and don't get drawn in a strange direction either by goodwill from funders or commissioners or advisors or anyone else and um, make this work for you. Above all, have fun and be creative.
Thank you. Um, well, we haven't got time for questions. We're going to wait until the end if we can. So I'm going to hand over at that point to um, Juno Sullivan, who's Chief Exec. And